Professor, and thank you all for the kind invitation to be able to present to um, this meeting today. Um, that's me, that's the talk, uh, as we've already had introduced. Um, I do some consultancy work. Um, those are my Twitter and email um, details, and uh, you are more than welcome to reach out to me um, afterwards if there's anything you want me to clarify. Um, so in terms of the session today, we're going to explore some of the barriers which limited the use of AI in clinical practice within the NHS. And to come at this from two points of view, one um, is the disconnect uh, between um, AI in the lab and clinical deployment, and then to explore it from our perspective um, that is based on the lived experiences and the solution we deployed in the Royal Bolton Hospital uh, back in April in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, this is work which we've won um, a number of awards for and we're hugely proud of this and I'd like to share that with you. So let's get this out of the way to start with, shall we? Um, different people get rather worked up about the definitions of AI. Of course, we mean artificial intelligence, but which flavor of artificial intelligence do we mean? Well, from my perspective and for the point of view of this talk, it means all of the above, anything analogous. So shall we draw the line, for example, at being able to add more than 16,000 entries to an Excel spreadsheet? Anything beyond that, we'll consider um, the remit of um, this talk. It's all science, none of this is magic, of course. Um, a little a history tour to start with. These are three very famous people in the data science um, and AI domain who you clearly all know, um, who've made some prophetic announcements way back in 2016 and 17, um, which are on screen with you. Uh, Professor uh, Jeffrey Hinton sort of doubled down on this and did say he's normally right, but then he changed his time frame. Uh, from five years to, well, all right, maybe I mean five to 10 years. The principle is the same. All of them back at that time frame thought AI is advanced enough that we don't need to um, employ radiologists anymore. Luckily for me, that word hasn't spread to my employers and they're still paying me to do this job. Um, some headlines, again, this is a report from McKinsey, which basically says the same, AI is great. We're not using it anywhere near enough. Um, and this was a paper from December 2017. You'll note the lead author, and perhaps it makes sense why he said what he said a month earlier in November 2017, that their algorithm they deployed um, <clears throat> operated at radiologist level detection of pneumonia on chest x-rays. And we will come back to that paper. So what was the scale over the past um, decade or so? Well, in 2010, there were just under 600 papers which were published um, regarding AI or machine learning. And by the end of last year, this had risen to just under 12 and a half thousand. RSNA is the largest medical conference in the world, which takes place in Chicago every winter. Um, and last year, there were 176 companies which had listed themselves under the ALML category. And of those, 136 actually came on site to exhibit as well. Now, of those companies who express an interest in this space, there are only 60 who actually have products which, uh, 60 companies which have products which meet regulatory approval in Europe, that's a CE mark, be that one, two A or two B. In total, there's 136 products. And in the US, as you can see there, there are 76 algorithms with FDA clearance and 36 which uh, receive FDA approval. Now, you would have thought with all that scale and scope that we've talked about that uh, um, AI in healthcare will be very much ahead, you know, um, top tier of use of this technology and its deployment. Well, this puts in context, this is um, an article in the Financial Times which discussed the impact of AI on business and society. And what you can see is that clearly high-tech financial services ahead of the game. Healthcare isn't even middle table mediocrity. We're really at the top end of the lower tier of its deployment, which, pl which plots the trajectory of demand over the next three years. And what we're going to do over the next few slides is explore why there is this disconnect between all the hype and hyperbole that we've talked about and the very bold claims that have been made, um, and just to explain why we still had a way to go before we got where we got um, this year. This is part of the reason why we did. Unfortunately, it was all about money. Um, when you're pitching these concepts for funding, they had to have visual impact. So in many ways, the hype of the solution was more important than its usability. None more so in this slide. Now as a radiologist, I operate in shades of gray, um, finding nuances on black and white images, what I do in a dark room day in, day out. So I clearly do more and we'll get to that bit in a second. But what you have here is these nice looking pictures, rather garish pictures from my point of view of heat maps, 
um, plotting pathology on a chest x-ray. They do absolutely nothing for how I work, but if you're pitching a slide deck to someone, they look really fancy and they look like um, you're doing cool things. And again, that's part of this disconnect. Um, here again is a, a rather frivolous example to explain some of the limitations. This is what photography started from, and this is what it, it came to. Um, these self-imaging booths, well, clearly taking x-rays is nothing more than medical uh, ionizing photography, right? So this would be the goal that we're aspiring to. Um, <clears throat> again, taking that one step further, we've seen all the data sets about imaging. So clearly um, using algorithmic deployments on images is very straightforward, isn't it? Well, maybe not so. This is a slightly fun example from October this year, where a match in Scotland deployed an AI controlled video camera and the commentator unfortunately had spent a significant portion of the match repeatedly apologizing because the camera tra tracking the bald head of the assistant referee rather than the ball itself throughout the match. And this is one of the problems that we need to address. Um, you have superficial understanding of some of the points of what happens in a domain and those superficial understandings are taken through to deploying an algorithm itself. That's why it's extremely important that you do get expert engagement in whatever field it is that you choose to deploy into so that you can circumvent some of these biases right from the outset. Then of course, when you're comparing um, healthcare to the financial sector or the health tech sector, you have the aspect of patient safety assurance. Now we all know that technology failures in this circumstance can lead directly to patient harm, even death. And with new types of technology, you potentially would have new types of failure. From your perspective, it's fairly straightforward. Um, you can assess for safety by asking the right questions, by making sure you've got the appropriate evidence base, and by trying to identify the concerns that you want to mitigate. And these can be dealt with by the appropriate QA models. But that doesn't take into account human factors. It's notoriously difficult to represent a clinical setting in these computational design models. And even when you do, even when you've got the perfect representation, you forget that these then have to be deployed in the wild. And no matter if you've been given the best clinical advice when you're working it up, this still goes into a live environment with human factor variation. So what happens at the bedside also is as much to do with who is there. For these reasons, the burden of proof needs to be much higher than you would normally have um, for your lab-based um, QA, because again, mistakes in this domain can be fatal. Let's look at this paper, which was published in 2019, very briefly. The, the links to um, anything I do reference is at the bottom of the slides. The nuance is developing AI for medical imaging. And what it said very briefly is that machine learning has shown significant improvement in healthcare, and it teased out some specific examples, for example, diabetic eye disease and metastatic breast cancer, and also the use of augmented reality um, surgery. But despite all these things, it does um, ask the question, why don't we see more of uh, AI in healthcare? It goes on to explain that there are challenges which are plaguing the machine learning community, which we're going to look into. And profoundly, it makes the statement that building algorithms is not straightforward. Some of these um, challenges include the availability of appropriate data sets, the issues with governance that we've looked at before as well. This is something which you're all too familiar with, the requirements for algorithmic development. So let's start with the top one. You need to define an appropriate clinical question. I'd like to thank um, Dr. Harvey, who allowed me to use this image for one of his papers. Now, what this represents is the pathway from the left, from the idea that you want to undertake imaging for a patient potentially, through all the way through the pathway to disseminating the results of that imaging interaction to either the patient or to other doctors so you can action them. Now, what you can see here are multiple touch points where potentially you can engage with the pathway with the use of machine learning, automation, uh, robotics, whatever you want to call it. But what we do find, unfortunately, is that for the past four or five years, effectively, we were all concentrating our solutions in this very, very um, narrow field here. And part of the reason is pixel data imagery is visually easy to identify and easy to pitch to. Remember, we talked about um, that aspect before. And we were unfortunately still stuck with chasing this wow factor rather than trying to do things which may be far more useful, <clears throat> making that journey more efficient and more effective. Something which any of you may have heard me say, and which I will not apologize for saying ad nauseum again, is that boring AI is good AI because that's probably the one which has the most useful impact to workflows.
Now, this just reiterates what I've said earlier. So we've had a number of these companies which are aggregating these narrow focus tools. An example of some of them are identifying lung nodules on a chest CT, identifying pathology on chest X-rays such as pneumothorax, um, that's collection of air around the lungs when it collapses, pneumonia, which is shadowing within the lungs, and all the various lines and tubes that you put within the body, either to drain away fluid, drain away air, or to assist with treatment options. Now, I've got decades of training to do with this. So trying to replicate what I do, how does that help me exactly? Identifying a bleeding or CT scan. Again, this is something which we have to do within certain metrics. So just trying to um, mimic what's been done by the human people starts asking the question is what are the benefits and even more so when you find that these solutions have limited integration with our overall working pathways and the software solutions we do to report um, is it all hype or hyperbole and you can understand why uh, there may be limited uptake the other part of it is whilst on the one hand you might consider it uh, eminently sensible to pitch um imaging-based AI to radiologists, but these are the same radiologists that the um, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all these other spheres are telling you that they're going to replace. So you're effectively pitching mint sauce to lambs and wondering why they're not so keen on it. But bear in mind, when you then push back and try and engage in discussion, because it doesn't suit the narrative that you want to have meaningful rather than um, flashy stuff, you get couched in the category of a blocker as a Luddite who doesn't want to move with the times, which clearly isn't the case. Um, and so we have this standoff that from some perspectives, it's all about jumping on a bandwagon and milking the cash cow rather than actually engaging in a meaningful manner. Another thing which really doesn't help at all is the fact that liability rests solely with the clinicians, not the companies who are deploying these. So just like a, a self-driving car, the person behind the wheel who actually doesn't do any of the driving carries the can if anything goes wrong. The same, it's the medical director or clinical director who chose to deploy this tool who takes all liability rather than the software developers and the company who've commercialized it if anything happens. And that you can appreciate causes some problems. So let's go back to the point I made earlier about who you're directing these questions to. Now I said, What's the point of talking to me about some of these findings because that's what I'm trained to do. But what's about if we just thought about the, thought about the same issue slightly differently? So instead of trying to replicate what I do in the way I do it, what we have now is a scenario where a patient has had a chest x has had a CT scan, and from the time of imaging straight away, you're able to flag to the ER doctors or the critical care doctors that there's something wrong. Or conversely, you're telling them that there's nothing wrong with this patient based on the imaging you've undertaken. So perhaps rather than waiting in multiple hours for this patient being sat in A&E for the report, you can arrange um, expedited discharges based on the AI telling you that there's nothing on there. Similarly, you put lines and tubes into a patient, but until you can clarify that it's in the right place, the doctors aren't able to use it because, for example, if you've put a tube in through the nose, which is meant to go into the stomach, the last thing you want is for that tube to be in someone's lung. So when you're pouring in medication and a feed directed to the stomach and you're filling up the lungs instead, that's probably not a wise idea. Whereas again, if you can AI to help you identify all these things in the right place, you've all of a sudden got the same product with essentially the same workflow, but you've identified a value proposition. So that image-based artificial intelligence is for the benefit of clinicians, not the radiologists, which they've been targeted for in the first place right now. In other words, and with something which I'll stress repeatedly, the use case for what you're doing is vitally important. That brings us on to the aspect of the training, validation, and testing data sets. Clearly, you need large enough numbers of high-quality data to facilitate this. Um, I will go through this very briefly because I appreciate this is more your domain level than mine. Um, again, I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Wozniczka, for the loan of this slide, which explores the MIDAR scale of data quality. At the top of this pyramid is level A category data, which is the stuff you want to use. It's anonymized. It's well annotated, it's contextual data, it allows interoperability between sites, and, and right at the bottom is poor quality data um, of variable quality. It may still have patient identifiable tags on it, so you really can't use it um, because you're breaching confidentiality and it may be unstructured. <clears throat> so let's go back to this paper which I talked um, about in December 2017 when everything seemed so rosy. Well, what Zekatel did a further study in 2018 2018, looking at the same 
um, a data set that was used to drive these algorithms. And what they found actually was that there were confounders within the study. And what they did was that they didn't um, direct the algorithm towards the pixel data, that is the chest X-ray image itself, but um, looked at where it was taken because they'd found that actually a significant majority of these X-rays um, were taken in, in a particular manner. They were mobile rather than they were being taken in the X-ray room. And those kinds of X-rays are tagged as such on the image itself. And so if they directed an algorithm to look purely at where the image was taken and the way it was taken, there was a disproportionate increased number of those which had pneumonia. And so the algorithm produced very similar results, mainly by identifying the location, because it learned that on mobile test X-rays, you have a high probability of pneumonia. There was another very similar study where someone um, advertised their solution was really, really, um, uh, high fidelity in identifying pneumothorax. You remember I talked about the air which causes collapse of the lungs on chest x-rays. But when you drill down into the data, yes, it was great, but what was it doing? Actually, the algorithm had learned that you treat a pneumothorax by putting in a line and tube. So it was flagging any x-ray which had a, a tube um, going into the chest on the image as positive for pneumonia. And guess what? It was right most of the time because that's what we did. So these limitations and confounders are teaching us that we need to be far more mindful of what we do when we analyze these things. And here are the offshoots. Um, what you have are, unfortunately, low numbers of high quality annotated data sets of which you've got these multiple companies around competing with to get hold of. Um, if you use lower quality data, you can get misdiagnoses and biases. The quality of the labeling is important so that you don't, for example, train an algorithm um, to spot a fracture in a bone, whereas it's not really a fracture, it's a normal anatomical variant. And you also need to ensure that the data you use can be um, interpreted in different environments as well. All these things are confounders which we need to look out for. This is a, a very unfortunate example to clarify what I've just said. Um, in 2013, IBM partnered with the MD Anderson Center in Texas um, with this solution called Watson for Oncology. They had a very noble aim. It, this was a um, huge PR marketing budget was put to this, you know, no less than curing cancer. But just as high profile as this marriage was in the first place, the divorce was just as acrimonious a few years later. And when the crack started to show, the finger of blame was pointed towards the engineers because what was being uncovered was that this software where they talked about um, putting in so much data that one single human oncology doctor could never hope to um, have read all this within one lifetime or some such. Um, actually, this was based on a much smaller number of hypothetical cancer patients rather than real patient data. And the outcome was that this solution Watson was making erroneous and to quote, downright dangerous cancer treatment advice. And so they parted their ways and the um, operation was deprecated in July, 2018. Again, because it was such high profile, that just ranked up the anxiety levels and made people far more suspicious as we go on. In terms of algorithmic development, um, clearly outcome measures are important for, for the point of view of this discussion, we'll consider them out of scope. Let's then take us to this year then and what we did. Um, from the point of view at clinician level, we've talked more of the lab side. Now let's see how this translates into the view on the shop floor in the hospital. I've broken these down into various headings. So the kind of questions we have are, what was the provenance of the data? Is it relevant to our environment? If you've worked up an algorithm based on a data set out of China and out of India, for example, how relevant will your algorithm be when you deploy it in good old Blighty in the Northwest of England? Who owns the data? Now this brought us to basically quicksand standstill for 2018 and 19, because understandably arguments raged. You have commercial companies who are offering their solutions for free to deploy in your hospital. The quid pro quo of course, was that we want to use your data. Well, if they're training up an algorithm based on NHS data and then charging the NHS back to sell it, how is that equitable? And you know, the conversation got even more nuanced was that if Granny Smith's knee x-ray was being used to train up data, well, why shouldn't Granny Smith um, benefit commercially <clears throat> from this itself? And until we managed to get past this discussion, we'd all but stopped any um, meaningful dialogue about how we could use AI within the NHS. Given that you're talking about the use of data, who else might access it if this is being squirted up into the nebulous cloud? And there was the discussion of whether you should be using on-prem or cloud-based solutions. Remember I talked about the um, FDA and CE um, clearance? 
not only do you need to ensure that the algorithm had regulatory approval, but was the approval in line with the proposed use? For example, you see multiple marketing um, swerves where someone says that you know they do have a CE mark, for example, you drill down and it's a class one CE mark, which is you know the kind of thing used for a stethoscope or um, diagnostic medical screen, not for clinical decision support, which would require class two. And even more when they, you then deploy and effectively you're trying to do autonomous AI based decision making, well that should be class three regulatory approval. So just make sure that what you're trying to do meets with the approval that the um, script you already have is. And this is something which we are becoming more aware of because it was all a bit too frightening beforehand. Um, data sharing agreements, well I alluded to this in the previous slide, and this is something which clearly in the public sector we're all obsessed by. Nobody wants to set the precedent, nobody wants to be held accountable um, and being splashed on the front page of the Daily Mail for uh, bringing uh, public sector and the NHS to its knees because of the way you've um, set up your own marketing agreement. Then there's the usual adage, well, no one's done it before. Um, are we doing it properly? Are we doing the right thing? Are we going to get the blame if something goes wrong? Um, I've talked about this and I make no apologies for going at this ad nauseum. Generally, it was We've worked something up in a lab, here's a solution. Now you go away and find a, a problem for it to do with. And because we've had all the confounders that I identified uh, previously, unfortunately, communication and collaboration dialogue was very poor. We, we've seen this in many domains that <clears throat> we tend to have a very adversarial um, approach in this country towards commercial organizations and rather than engaging with them, they're always seen as the enemy. And those clinicians, those public sector people, those um, academics who engage with them in some way, shape or form had up till now been seen to sell out. And we all suffer for it because that means that we weren't able to give our domain knowledge in a useful manner. Um, the last bit is clearly we're all busy people. Um, I don't have enough time to do what I need to do anyway. If you're going to make a change, will this change slow down what I do? Then you go back to the usual issues, which not just the NHS, but any public sector or research body. There's no money. We can't afford anything anyway. Ooh, what you're talking about sounds expensive. We need to keep the lights running. Stop pitching stuff to me, which means you're going to ask for money. I can't afford it. And up till now, because the discussion hadn't been appropriately nuanced, there was this chicken and egg scenario of the value-based proposition. I've alluded to the time and, you know, forget the uh, people using it, actually getting engagement from the exec sponsors or your director of finance was very difficult because everyone was busy um, doing their day job. All sounds very doomy and gloomy, but thankfully things did change. Um, here's the snippet from a headline from another McKinsey report from this year, um, which said that given this global pandemic, it speeded up the adoption of many digital technologies by several years. And thankfully, these changes can be here for the long haul. That is, there is a change in mindset which overcomes some of these barriers which we talked about. Uh, this is what we did. Um, this is the uh, BBC News and the Bolton News talking about the solution we deployed, which is this QXR solution. Um, and what we did was we didn't look at making diagnosis on x-rays and target them towards radiologists. It was to help our clinicians as a basically permanent level of clinical decision support that they could reference to help in their decision making. So going back to the aspect of patient safety, the decisions were always made by a human in the way that they always had been, but we were given an additional tier of information round the clock, seven days a week to help in that. So if we step through this in the manner that I've described before, we didn't go out for the sake of finding an AI and working backwards. What we had was when the pandemic struck, we looked in particular about what was going on in Italy. It was terrifying. You had hospitals which were saturated. There weren't enough ventilator beds. You can remember, you know, we've set up all these Nightingale hospitals. We had Tesla. Uh, we had the Formula One companies producing ventilators, but it's still a limited resource. And so the thought was, not only is resource limited, but the humans are resource limited as well. If we have to self-isolate, if we become an L on well, we still have to provide a service. What can we do to make most efficient use of our high dependency and critical care beds? What can we do to identify which patients are getting worse and need to go to ITU? And conversely, which are getting better and come out of ITU so that the next patient who needs it can go in there as, as fast as possible. And that was the use case that we were thinking of. And at the same time, we talk about that we come across this study in San, San Rafael in Italy by Cure, 
which, which was exactly along these lines. And so then we had further dialogue and collaborated. Because we deployed this clinical decision support, it had no impact on the way um, our clinicians were working. This is a product which had been trained on a two and a half million cases. Um, it's used in 40 sites around the world and it was retooled for COVID again on 11 and a half thousand positive cases based on the scenario where people were trying to spin up things always with an altruistic um, intention to try and help. Well, you know, we're based on five or 10 or 50 um, COVID chest x-rays. And, and so the quality of the data was very important. The other point to bear in mind was that irrespective of this was an, an Indian company, they had deployed in Europe. Um, it, you can um, empathize with Italy and the Italian patient mindset a bit more comfortably as well. We completely uh, bypassed the issues of a data security and governance as far as we insisted on an on-prem server. There was no sending anything out of our trust firewall, and this was overseen by our CIO and CTO. In fact, to the extent that even when the company wants to access its own server for any maintenance work, it's only by role-based timed access overseen by one of our IT folk. Uh, we ensured clearly that this um, was uh, a product which has uh, C marking and specifically I go back to the, the C approval was in line with the UK use case that we deployed. Um, <clears throat> now, whilst the data sharing agreement is not really relevant in this case, um, I would say taking a slightly uh, helicopter view is that we have some assurance from this point of view because the Secretary of State Matt Hancock has said that the copy that's been introduced to allow NHS organizations to share patient data to work up solutions for COVID has been extended already to March 2021. And the hope is that this model can be extended further. So again, we won't have the stringent and very restrictive access to data that we've had in, in previously. Because we were mindful that we were trying to do this um, in an open and sharing manner. You know, there are tons of proof of concepts which are going on up and down the country and everything's under the radar. No one wants to talk about them until they can tell you how great everything is. But we took a bit of a risk that, you know, we want to do this in the, in the public eye so we could all learn together. And in this regard, we had a very frank and open dialogue with NHS X right from the outset in February, which was two way. We talked about what they were doing. They were happy to take feedback from what we were doing. And in turn, they were being informed by it. And we took some advice from some very expert people in this domain as well. We used established governance models and we engaged our procurement and governance teams. <clears throat> um, in terms of the cost, again, this goes back to there's no money in the kitty. We're now in the midst of a global pandemic and people were ensuring that they were able to think differently. Let's put AI to the side for a second. Um, normally for my day job, I used to leave my house, get into a car, do a 50 mile round trip to go into another office in the hospital to sit in front of a computer to do my reporting. Um, we'd been talking about home-based reporting for ages. No one ever found the money. All of a sudden, when you're isolating or when you're unwell and you can't come into a highly infective environment, it seemed like a good idea that why don't we have these reporting workstations and radiologists home. And so some of the perceived barriers that you had before, which were more just about rigid thinking, were done away with by being more flexible in approach. And of course, we all know many of the advances that you get from flexible working environments and that we can now suddenly leverage. From the point of view of our hospital, <clears throat> we had a bit of a head start insofar as there are a group of us who already had an interest in artificial intelligence far before the pandemic struck. And we had just been um, putting some thought to how we might perhaps safely review and evaluate some products um, within a clinical setting. So on that regard, we had some clinicians, our CIO, we had a senior responsible officer, the chief operating officer in the trust. We had a digital group that had all been set up. So when we wanted to consider this tool, we didn't have to work around, you know, who were going to be the appropriate stakeholders? Who did we have to inform? Who did we have to get buy-in from? They were already available to us um, to have these discussions with. Um, what then we can see is what happened within the NHS more broadly. And another positive aspect is this um, artificial intelligence and healthcare awards that was a 140 million pound fund that's been made available to try and entice the best and brightest of AI technologies to meet the strategic aims in the NHS long-term plan. So again, we've now got collaboration within central bodies, in this case, the AAC, NHSX, and the Natural Institute of Health Research. And of course, all of a sudden when funding is available, it tends to de-risk it and um, 
academics, directors of finance, and even clinicians all of a sudden become suddenly more interested and find time where they might not otherwise been able to, to um, have some thought towards this. We had some interest in, in our hospital, but you know, there are many, many other places who don't have people who've got that degree of engagement or horizon scanning of AI, but clearly have um, clinical problems or other problems that they may perhaps want to leverage artificial intelligence or machine learning tools for, but might not feel confident enough to do. This was a buyer's guide, which was produced by NHS X earlier this year, with 10 questions which step you through the kind of mindset you need to do to make an informed procurement. Uh, we were very proud to have um, fed into this based on our experiences as well. And this allows and um, opens up this uh, sector to far more uh, wider parts within the NHS. And just coming to the end now, remember I talked about the impact on workflows. Well, the Royal College of Radiologists has also produced a position statement, which is outlining some standards um, which AI companies and solutions need to conform to when you're going to deploy them in the clinical sector within the imaging space. So these were some of the aims which I hoped to address within um, this presentation. Um, the disconnect between AI in the lab and clinical deployment I feel was based upon a very lab-centric understanding of these AI capabilities, which has now become more matured. Um, and we are getting over the complexities of real-world implementation that had been previously underappreciated. And we've also got more robust um, reporting tools as well, the consort and uh, spirit um, frameworks that have been outlined a few months previously. From our experiences, just to reiterate, what we did was we had a specific use case for a defined clinical problem and then found a solution that could meet that problem, not the other way around. We ensured that there was associated regulatory and data compliance, and we had a wide buy-in of stakeholders. Um, just ending on a bit of fun is, again, the obsession had been um, bad AI was uh, Skynet to replace humans, as you'd seen other spheres, um, Whereas actually what we want is to leverage these tools um, as a support metric to improve quality and efficiency. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation, Rizwan. Uh, in the view of time, I might say we will try to proceed to the next presentation pretty quickly. There's a bit of a longer question text in the chat, but my, I don't know if you can see it. Maybe you quickly you want, uh, would like to respond to that one. Uh, sure, give me two seconds to read it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There's a few more coming in, but maybe, oh no, there's a well, sorry for the length question, but maybe we can do that. Um, so, yes, I do. Uh, you, you've basically uh, very nicely covered some of the issues that I was trying to get through in the first place. Um, having large amounts of data in itself means nothing. It's very important that we're curating these data sets. You've got um, a team together who all bring their specialist input into it. So they need to be appropriately um, anonymized. They need to be appropriately annotated. Um, and then, as you said, you, you need to make sure that you've got enough to train your algorithm, to test it, and to do the validation. This is something which we, we also want to do at a national level. So the NHS is trying to actually put together a database um, of image um, repositories so that we can invite some of these uh, solutions from around the world and train them in a UK centric repository to see if they can form and are useful in the environment we want them to deploy at. So I, I completely agree. It's a challenge, but it's a challenge which has been recognized and we're trying to um, find ways of overcoming it. Thanks. I, I would just suggest all further questions we will direct to you. So people are welcome to email you with further questions. Of course, my pleasure.